Hi, this is Bob Sarantino from Italian Roots and Genealogy, and I'm here today with Paul Nauta, who is the Senior Marketing and Communications Manager for FamilySearch.org. So thanks, Paul. Thanks for being here. Hey, I am happy to be here any day to talk Italian. I am game. That's great. That's great. And so you're out, you're out in Utah, yes? I am a transplant to Utah, yes. My family hails from New York and Louisiana which are common settling beds, I suppose, for Italian immigration in the U.S. But Utah has been my home for over 30 years now. Oh, so that's a long time. That's quite a long time. I think uh, my only time in Utah was standing on the four corners. (laughs) Well, that's not a complete representation of the state. You need to make it north a little bit. Maybe you can come next year for Roots Tech if we hold Roots Tech on the ground. To start off, I'd like to talk about your family research and, um, you know, when and why and how did you get started? You know, my fascination with uh, my family history um, started when I was actually a really young child. I had one of those really large, um, ornate family Bibles that sat on our sofa table. Uh, So that stood between us and the TV. Um, and I don't know how common that is, quite frankly, um, among Italians, but I, I'm going to guess that there are quite a few older um, Italians that may remember those here in the U.S. But in that, that book one day, it was sitting there on this wooden stand, and I was flipping through it, and there was this family tree in the middle of it, right? A uh, very ornate page, and my father had begun to scribble in our uh, family history. And that was the first time as, as a young child that I had, I guess, thought about myself or saw myself in the context of, of a family tree. And of course, all the names in it were Italian, you know, Benvenga and Dinaut and Todaro and Pizzillo, which names that, you know, I've been around all my life uh, up to that point, a few years. So that kind of planted a seed in my mind that I was part of this larger Italian diaspora family tree. And I think from that point on, as people were visiting us as they normally would through the course of the holidays or family events, I began to pay a little more attention to last names, you know, the surnames, and I could kind of place them back to the book. So that was the earliest start in my uh, family history. And then as I got into my teenage years, um, I realized that uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had a a lot of microfilms and discovered that they had films for Italy. And that took me to the next phase. Well, that's really neat. Um, I, I was, I, we didn't have the Bible, but we had, you know, the photo album, the, you know, the black pages with the little corners and we slid the pictures in and, uh, we always had a card from my great grandfather, uh, Nicola Piramalo. And he was, the, the card said from the Dukes of Capricata and, you know, and, and so I was always fascinated with that card and was my dad's, uh, uh, grandfather, but you know, I always looked at the book with my mom, and she always said that you know my great grandfather was a duke or a count or something like that, you know, and so yeah, you know, I was always fascinated by that, and you know that kind of left my mind. You know, got married, raised a family, did all of that, and then probably I guess about thirteen, fourteen years ago, I pulled out the card and I said, well, this is probably the starting point, you know, for for dad's family, and. Uh, uh, I found out a lot of just amazing things, not only from his family, but more from my great grandmother. Uh, and she's Cracciolo, and I've traced that family back to 950 AD. So to that point, though, so I find it fascinating that your family comes from New York and New Orleans. So how'd that happen? Yeah, so my dad is actually from New York. My dad's father uh, immigrated, so my paternal grandfather immigrated uh, from Italy, and he settled in Staten Island, New York. And my dad's mother's family, <clears throat> excuse me, is from from Naples, the Naples area. So, 
uh, Sassano is one of the towns that they're from, Salerno. <clears throat> and um, I never really got to know my, my dad's parents, my paternal grandparents. They all passed away when I was very young, two, three, four, five years old. I have some very vague memories of, of one of my visits um, to New York when I was a young child. Uh, so everything I knew about that side of the family was through through family stories. Like you, there we had those those photo albums as well with stories. And Dad also had some postcards from the old country, um, where he had visited during uh, when he was in the Korean War. He did a stint in Germany, and he did a quick visit on a furlough to Italy. And he didn't speak Italian too well, or at least he thought he did. But the dialect that they spoke in the town where his father came from was uh it was a foreign language to him and and he quite frankly um was embarrassed by that i think and um they their customs were a little foreign to him and so he didn't talk much about it and my my paternal grandfather my, my dad's father discouraged him and his siblings from ever getting in touch with the family in italy and when asked why he just said, you know what, they're really, really poor. And every time you reach out to them, um, he says, they're probably going to, you know, ask for support and things along that line. So that was the line he gave with them. And they respected his opinion. And so we didn't ask a whole lot about that. On my mom's side of the family, my mom's family all immigrated mostly through New Orleans. My dad's into New York. And my mom and dad were pen pals uh, when he was in the service. And so they got married. My dad moved to Louisiana. So I grew up in the inf under the influence of my maternal Italian grandparents. They lived next door and, um, and ran a mercantile down in Baton Rouge on North Street. So I was always surrounded by Italian communities and influence, but mostly from my Sicilian grandparents. Um, and so how I began to make the connection it was very, very fascinating. I began doing my family history research using the microfilm from Family Search through a local family history center. And I used a desktop genealogy program to organize that. Amazingly, Family Search has the, um, you know, at the time it was on microfilm, it had the civil registration of Italy starting in 1806. So I was able to do a lot of my genealogy using microfilm. And when Family Search put their tree online and Ancestry put their tree online, I uploaded my genealogy to both sites. And the aha for me was um, one day I got an email um, through the actual uh, Family Search system from a Domenico Di Nauta. Um, in uh, Cagnano Verano, which is where uh, my my paternal grandfather, Antonio, is from. And I just got so excited. When, when you get something like that, having not spoken with anyone from the old country and been told by your, you know, your grandfather, don't mess with it, don't reach out. I was just, you know, beside myself uh, with excitement. And so he says, you know what, I was he goes, I'm a student right now up at the University of Bologna, but I'm from Cagnano Verano. He says, all the Dinaltas are related. He says, I've seen your tree online. I have no idea exactly how we're related. He says, but when I go home for Christmas break, I will, uh, I'll share your genealogy with your permission with my grandpa. And uh, let's see if we can figure out how my branch is related to your branch. And um, that was just so fascinating. And so as promised about a week after Christmas that year, he, uh, he emailed me back and said, Hey, my grandfather walked over to the, uh, the town archive here in Cagnano and, uh, the archivist is related to you and he wants to talk to you personally. So I should have said out front, I speak Italian and can read Italian. So that's, that's a blessing and a benefit. And, uh, this archivist uh, gave me a call. And his name was also Antonio Di Nauta. And he says, your, your great-grandfather and my grandfather, he said, were, were siblings. He says, so that's how you and I are related. He says, and you've got first 
cousins still alive here in town and they would love to meet you. Wow. That's amazing. That's incredible. So he gave me their names and phone numbers and told me how I was related to them. So basically my, um, my grandfather's parents had uh, several children and their uh, his brother Michael had lots of kids and one of Michael's kids were still alive. So Vincenza and then his he had a sister and she actually only had uh, one child and he was still alive as well. And Tony, matter of fact, both of them are still alive today. They're in their 90s. But I, I gave Vincenza a phone call and it was like we never did not know each other immediately the bond was set. Uh, we weeped with joy. She was so excited to, to talk to me. And you would have never thought that we had never known each other prior to that phone call. And I think that's common with a lot of Italians that uh, are trying to get back to the old country when they're able to make a connection. It doesn't matter what your immigration routes are. Um, they accept you immediately. As a matter of fact, I I jumped on a plane right away to go see them within a couple of months and uh, got the rest of the story. But they didn't really want to look at the family tree after the first time. They, they just, your family, I, I didn't even have to prove to them how we were related. They just kind of took me on my honor that we were related. They knew my grandpa and everything else wasn't important. Let's just, let's just celebrate as a family. But of course, I wanted to learn as much as I could and get all the history that I could. But that's, that's kind of the, the, the blood love of, of the Italians, I think, in Italian families, at least from my experience, that's what it was. But I wanted to explain why my grandfather did what he did. Uh, when I told them the reason we hadn't got a hold of them, they already knew. They said, yeah, 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 we knew all about that. And I said, well, you may know all about that, but I don't know all about that. I said, why did he not want us to contact you? And he said, because your grandfather, this was Vincenza telling me this, because her father um, was his brother. She says, your father went to the U.S. like everyone did to create a better life. And um, he says he was married here um, before he went to the United States. And while he was there trying to create a home for us here, um, his wife in Italy uh, had an indiscretion with someone in the town. And, you know, from a very small town, everybody knows everybody's business. And my grandfather was humiliated. And so he kind of swore that he was never going to go back. And in order to, uh, you know, save his pride to that extent, he just discouraged any of us from communicating with the family uh, in Italy. So when he died, the relationship died with him. But um, through doing my research and putting it online, I was able to make a living connection and uh, restore those relationships with first cousins in Italy. So that's my dad's side. It's, it's pretty amazing. And we are still very, very close. I've been back at least a dozen times over the years. And my kids are now keeping in touch with the um, cousins their age. And so the tradition continues. Wow. That's fantastic. Uh, first cousins too. That's really amazing. I, uh, you know, from my dad's family, my dad's family, they're from Naples, but uh, uh, the, the the great-great-grandparents were from uh, Calabria and Molise, you know, various towns. But because of the noble roots, they were in Naples, I guess, because it was the kingdom of Naples, and that's where all the action was. Um, but with me, I had that card, Piramalo, and very, very uncommon name. It's only that one family has it. And um, when I started researching that, I, I found the family on uh, uh, Libro di Oro, and, but I couldn't be 100% sure. And so then I found um, that Nicola Piromalo married an Emilia Caracciolo, and the names matched. My oldest aunt was Emilia. My father was Nicola. He was the second son. That all made sense. Uh, so I called my cousin who lived with my grandmother, and I said, do you know the name Cracciolo? And she said, well, yeah, that's Nanny's mother. So I said, oh. I said, I had no idea. Um, so then I went on Facebook, and I started searching Piromalos and Caracciolos and all of that. And with the Piromalo family, what I was able to piece together was uh, I found 
uh, fourth cousins. Some of the third cousins are still alive, but I was able to verify that that's the family that I came from. Uh, and that, you know, to your point, that was just extremely, extremely exciting. Um, but one of the most interesting things about that family is, as far as I knew, my grandmother was the only Piramalo that had come to the U.S. And I could never understand why, because she came from a well-to-do family. And Ancestry, oh, maybe three or four years ago, I got, a, I got an email and um, Linda said, I think we're researching the same person. I wonder if we're related. And it was a Maria Piramalo. I'd come to the United States 10 years before my grandmother and grandfather. And I said, yeah, I would definitely relate it. I said, Maria Piramalo is my great-grandfather's sister. And so she was like, are you sure? I said, I'm, I'm positive. There's no question about it. You know, there's the, the, definitely. So, uh, but the most amazing part of the whole story is that her grandmother and grandfather like I said, I had no idea that there was anybody else in this family, but her grand grandparents' names were Pitex. Uh, her grandfather was from Sicily. And I always remember my father talking about they were going over to Pitex's house when I was eight, nine years old or something like that. It turns out that the two families were so integrally connected throughout the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, and 50s in the United States and I had no clue. So now, so now, have you gone to all the hometowns in Italy? We'll be right back. Experience Italy like never before, traveling with a scheduled group or create your own bespoke tour with friends with philitaly.com. Pack your bags and follow Phil. That's www.philitaly.co. You know, for the most part, I have. I th there's only a, a couple of lines that I'm struggling with. One of those is is actually out of uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. My um, my grandpa Antonio Dinalta's wife was ter T Teresa Benvenga, and um, it, that line right there is 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 a tough one. Her her father um, came from. Naples and her mother for the longest time they the family was telling me she, her name was um, was Rosie Bernard <laughs> but that didn't add up because Rosie Bernard they said didn't speak English worth a lick she was just could only speak Italian I said well guys that's that's not an Italian last name where's that coming from I said I don't know it's what we that's what we always called her Grandma Bernard Grandma Rosie so I was fortunately able to find. Uh, their marriage record, um, Giuseppe Ben or Giovanni Benvenga and and uh, Rosie. She was actually a Garone, um, G A R O N E, and her mother was a Basolano. But those are two surnames in that area that are not common. You can find a couple of Garones, but I can't find any Basolanos. And um, on her wedding certificate, her dad had, had already uh, passed away. He was noted as deceased. So. Um, I know she got married at a really young age, like the age of 13 to my, my grandfather, um, my great grandfather there in the area. But that, that's been a hard one for me. I've not been able to, uh, to break that nut and move further back. I, I think I probably need to make a trip out when this virus clears and see if I can spend a day in the records there at the Mount Carmel Catholic church in, in Hoboken and see if I can, can do some good there but but otherwise i've been to italy and i have visited everywhere they've come from that's the only branch i didn't on my mom's side this is kind of interesting she's so they're they're sicilian they're all from a little town in alia and and thereabouts which is in the mountains outside of palermo just just in an hour from cefalu a lot of people will know cefalu um, I was having a hard time. We didn't have the records at the time. I was doing research on microfilm for Alia, and I was I was writing letters to the the local priest 
uh, in, in that church to see if he could help me out. Never got any response. Sent some money. Still never heard a response from him. And I just felt this, this serendipitous draw that um, I needed to, to find these, these ancestors and link them to my family. And um, so some of your readers will respond to this. I began to just exercise some faith and pray. I, I'm, I'm one of these people that prays and applies faith to his genealogy. And I find that doors open. And I'll share with you two examples of that. But in this particular case, I, I just felt I should focus on my mother's side and was trying to do the, had done all the research I could and couldn't get past the civil registration at that point, needed to get into the church records. Didn't do any good by reaching out to the church. So I just began praying and applying some faith to it um, with some urgency and fascinating one day at work, my neighbor calls me and he says, Hey Paul, I, um, I met this Italian fellow on the train uh, into work today and a uh, really nice guy and uh, told him I work with, my neighbor was an Italian guy and um, he was going over to the family history library for something, he said. And I gave him your name and number and told him when he's done in the library to give you a call, you would take him to lunch. And I said, well, Gordon, um, one, thank you. Two, every time you strike up a conversation with an Italian on the train in downtown Salt Lake, don't necessarily offer my resources for lunch um, with them. Uh, so we laughed about that. And sure enough, like clockwork, this uh, Italian fellow calls me um, around lunchtime. And um, he was he was a little embarrassed and uncomfortable, awkward. You know, he met this guy on the train and told him, that, hey, give Paul a call and he'll take you to lunch. But I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's my neighbor. I said, um, what are you doing for lunch? Come on over. Let's uh, let's let's meet for lunch. So here's the serendipitous things, right? So I'm sitting here talking with this guy. His name is Giovanni Criscione. He's from, uh, he said he was from Sicily. So now my ears perked up, right? I said, really, Sicily, what part of Sicily? I think he said he was from Ragusa, which was my, where my family from. I said, well, I've got family from Palermo. I said, my mother's side's from Palermo, and I can't make a connection there. And he says, well, have you written to the priest? I said, I have. He says, I have been to that church where your relatives are probably a dozen times. He was a, he was a researcher uh, from, from Italy. It's not something that he did professionally. He just loved to do it. Um, his dad was the district attorney for Sicily. Um, and so he traveled with his father and got to know all the priests and archivists throughout the area. This was kind of just his hobby. And he says, um, I, know, I know the church, I know that priest. He says, I'll tell you what, you book a flight to Palermo. And he says, and I will meet you at the airport. And I will go with you to Alia and I'll introduce you to the priest. He says, and let's spend a couple of days doing, doing your research. So you tell me how that works, right? Um, you, you begin studying, uh, your family line like that. You feel driven internally that that's something that you need to do. And so to me, the natural thing was to apply some faith, pray about it and doors opened for me that way. And I've got a number of stories like that where that's the case. So, you know, I went, went to Italy again that year and Giovanni met me in Palermo. We drove over to Alia. He introduced me to Padre Di Sclafani. And this priest, he was, he was wonderfully delightful. I didn't bring up the fact that I'd been writing him and sending him money. I was just grateful to be there. But uh, he here's this church that has been here for just hundreds of years. And he took us to this little uh, concrete walled archive, one room archive, cold as could be. It was in the winter and um, says, here's the records that you want. They had two shelves or two bookcases um, there. And here were all these books um, going back to the 1500s, late 1400s. Um, you know, to put that in perspective, older than the Constitution of the United States and the Magna Carta, right? And it was right next to, on the other side of the wall from the altar of this really old church there. And it was such a unique, surreal 
experience. And he, <laughs> he says, I don't know you guys too well. The priest said this. He says, um, he says, and I don't have the time to sit here with you and go through the books. And he said, that's okay. I can read Italian. Giovanni um, had a had a master's degree in Latin handwriting. And of course, it was a very good researcher. And he just, we said, just if you just let us research, we, we don't need your help. So he says, well, I'm going to have to lock you in here. <laughs> He says, I'm busy. I got things to do. And it was one of these old medieval like dungeon doors, the big keys. And it was kind of str- the thought went through my mind is nobody knows I'm here except the people I'm renting a room from in town and <laughs> Giovanni. And the, but he locks us in this room and clank. And you can hear the, the door lock. He says, I'll be back around lunchtime. I can't bring you food or water because we don't want that in here. So like, OK, so. We, uh, he locked us in and I was like a kid in a candy store. Again, all these old books. And we started with the most current and walked our way back. Giovanni told me how to set out cards and start capturing the families because we didn't know how many days he'd let us in there. But this went on for two or three days. We just, uh, we would come in the morning and he would let us in, lock us in, come back at, at noon. Um, he actually brought us some water and lunch. He kind of softened up to us after a while. But he'd lock us back in. Evening time comes. He says, I'm going home. You guys got to go home. <laughs> so he'd uh, kick us out. Um, but what a neat experience to just generation after generation after generation to see the history of your family unfold before your eyes in these, these old books that captured these key events in the lives of my ancestors. And as you're reading these christenings and baptisms and things like that, to realize that those all happened here right outside the door at the altar of the church, right on the other side of this wall. Uh, sometimes I had to just stand up and just go look and walk to the altar when I was allowed to, to leave the archive and just sit there and take it all in um, and just walk around the town where they walked. And like you, I tried to go, I wrote down some of the streets that were mentioned, um, but they were all kind of the the low rent areas. None of them really had a a definitive address. It was always the, the lower street in this part of town type thing. So we, I walked around there and talked to the locals to figure out where it was. And just there's, it changes you is all I can say. When you walk where your ancestors have walked and you can just feel the influence so much deeper to every fiber of your body when you're able to be where they've been and you realize that you're standing on their shoulders. So you, you are in part who you are today because of who they were and the sacrifices they made. And I don't take that for granted. Uh, it changes me. It gives me something to live up to. And, you know, I, I want to pass that honor and privilege on to, to my descendants. No, I, I, I understand it. And, you know, interesting that you said, cause I, I, I have a, Similar kind of thing that happened, but uh, I, I did an interview with, she's a genealogist, uh, but also a spiritualist. And when I was talking to her, I said, you know, I said, there's something, not everybody has it, but some of us do, that drive and that need to find this information. There seemed to be one or two in every family. And I said, but sometimes things just happen. And she said, well, they want to be found. You know that, right? And I said, I never thought of it that way, but that makes sense. And she said, she said, yeah, she said, that's why things happen. And what happened with me was uh, my mom's family in, in body was very well documented. I mean, they have some of the best records from Torito and Aquaviva de la Fonte. You wouldn't think those two little farming towns would be <laughs> have that many, those many records out there, but they do. And so I was finding a lot of stuff there and uh, I was finding uh, some things from, from dad's mom. Uh, Pio Malo, I was stuck. So I said, well, I'm going to hire somebody to help me find, confirm what I think about Pio Malo. And Sorrentino, I was at a dead end. I knew my grandfather, my great grandfather's name had to be Achille because that was my uncle's name. Couldn't find any records for him at all. Nothing. Uh, so I hired somebody over there to do some research for me. He came back with a bunch of records on Pio Malo, Cracciolo, all of that stuff. And I didn't hear anything. And I originally hired him to find this Sorrentino. 
And about a year went by, I didn't have anything. I was just about to contact him again and say, you know, if you can't find anything, just let me know and we'll, we'll forget about it. My cousin Louise passed away. Uh, she had lived with my grandparents, my Sorrentino grandparents. She passed away. Two days later, I got about 30 records from my researcher in Italy on the Sorrentino family. So, you know, coincidence? We'll be right back. Lafayette, we are here. The French history podcast for the American public by a Frenchman. Learn all about France's fascinating history. It's great characters like Charlemagne, Joan of Arc, Louis XIV, or Napoleon, but also the great events that marked France, Europe, and sometimes the whole world. Lafayette, we are here. Available wherever you get your podcast or on lafayettepodcast.com. A bientôt. What a blessing. Yeah, I, I don't believe in, in coincidences. Obviously, I work for Family Search, and Family Search is uh, as a nonprofit subsidiary of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. So we, we believe in the eternal nature of families and that we will see our loved ones again. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a very spiritual, serendipitous work, whatever the term is that you want to use. And the more you you dig into it and the closer you get to these ancestors, doors will doors will open for you. And I think uh, you'll have very sacred experiences. You know, the last experience I'll share kind of on this segment for you is uh, this rosy Garone, I told you about. She was known as Rosie Bernard <laughs> to me up into this time. And this wasn't too long ago. I um, I felt Rosie's influence in my life that Rosie wanted to be found. And um, I I tried everything from calling the church in, in uh, Hoboken and just everything that researchers told me to do. I'm, I'm not a professional researcher, by the way. I've just spent a lot of time searching my Italian roots. So I, I'm, I'm dangerous with Italian research, you know, because of how much I've done. But I just kept feeling, feeling Rosie's influence in my life. She just wanted to be, you know, the record straight, wanted to be found. And I finally just said out loud, I just said, Rosie, I would love to find you, Grandma, but I have done everything that I can do. So you start opening some doors for me and show me what to do, and I'll walk through those doors. And um, and I said, a matter of fact, I'm going to a Jewish genealogy conference in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, um, in about two or three weeks. Why don't you connect me with someone while I'm there on the East Coast with... Uh, that can help me find your records so I can learn a little more about you. And so I kind of put it on my ancestors shoulders in a, in a kind of a nonverbial or proverbial way. So here I am, I'm at this conference two weeks later and I'm standing in the family search booth and I'm talking to this, uh, to this uh, rabbi, a rabbinical rabbi and something that woman in the booth next to me kind of drew my attention. And I'm, I look over at her, her name card, and I noticed that she was the assistant state archivist for the state of New Jersey. That's where Rosie was from, right? So I had to excuse myself from my conversation with this rabbi as uh, this lady came to our booth. And I said, can I just bug you for a minute? And I said, and I told her my situation with my grandmother. So she was kind of in a hurry, kind of brushed me off. She goes, write down which, the information that you know on a, on a business card and give it to me. So I did really, really quick, got all excited about it. But I thought, you know, she was kind of so dismissive to me and so much in a hurry. I said, I am never going to hear from this woman again. Um, but the next morning I was preparing to do a presentation at one of the, in one of the halls, there are sessions. And this woman approaches me at the front of the room while I'm getting set up with my laptop. And she hands me this pink envelope. And I said, what is this? Again, she just brushes me off with her hand and says, don't worry about it. He says, do your presentation. After your presentation, take a look at it. I could hardly remember my presentation. I was so excited to look at that envelope, but I, I didn't. And I waited when I got done with the presentation, fielding questions, what have you. I opened up that envelope. And here in this envelope was the marriage certificate of Rosie. And it wasn't Rosie Bernardo. It was Rosie Garone. And it mentioned her parents, uh, Michael Garone, and uh, her mother was Maria Besolano. 
and uh, just you know you just have this emotion that comes over her and I could uh, feel the gratitude of you know of Rosie that she had been found and uh, we knew who she was and could continue the research on those lines so stuff like that happens you know so I guess the moral of the story for me on this part for people is hey Put your family history online, start doing it, gather what you can, source it as best you can and put it online where it can be discovered. And, you know, next generations, current generations of Italians are far more web enabled than previous generations. And the chances of you hooking up with uh, your, your ancestors and making connections that way are getting better and better and higher and higher. And the next thing is um, become familiar with the question marks in your family tree. And if, if you're a person of faith, start applying some faith, um, you know, as you're focusing on those. And I, I th- would say that doors are going to open for you the way doors have opened for me and in very amazing, miraculous ways. And uh, it, you just can't explain how those things happen. Uh, yeah, they, they want to be found. They want to be connected. They want to be remembered. And uh, miracles will happen if you apply that faith. Yeah, and, and I've heard so many stories about that. Uh, just one real other quick one. I was in an interview with somebody and very small town in northern Italy. She didn't know anything about it. Um, she put it out there on Facebook and somebody responded and said, I know the town. I live near there. And if you come to Italy, I'll, I'll help you out. She wasn't a professional. She is now. She became a professional because of this. Uh, and as um, the person was looking for a place to live she, or a place to stay, she, uh, she said, you know, I went through 100 places. I was looking for a and b I narrowed it down to, you know, two places. I did eeny, meeny, miny, right? And I picked one. And she was talking to them about booking. And they said, why are you coming here? This is like, you know, the middle of nowhere. And she said, well... You know, my grandmother was from there. My great grandmother's from there, and this is the name. And I don't know anything about her except, you know, she didn't have any children and all of that. And the woman on the phone said, "Wait, I, I, let me go get my mother." As it turned out, that the people that she, the, her, her great grandmother, had no children. She left the land where these people lived and had this B and B to a cousin or something like that, uh, or a friend. I don't remember which one it was. So just by this fate, she was staying in a home that was once owned by her great-grandmother. Wow, what a wonderful story. Isn't that wild? Isn't that yeah. crazy? Yeah, it, it, it really is. Yeah, you just do it. You know, for your listeners, don't give up and... Go back and walk where they've walked. It changes you. It's, um, I, I've, yeah, I, I've been able to actually find um, in the old part of Cagnano Verano where my dad's family's from, there's a little, they, they still own all the property, by the way, that the family has farmed for hundreds of years. Oh, cool. That's nice. Um, so they make the olive oil and they make cheeses from the, for the local area. And um, I, I, I will confess that I have risked during the past years, bringing in contraband cheese <laughs> from the family into the country, true Italian that I am, right? Um, it's just fun, Bob. You know, you never get tired of these stories. Oh, the other fun thing is the recipes, right? You, when you're back there, you, you realize how some of these recipes, even though we've immigrated, have carried on through the family um, today and how much of what we do today actually was what they are still doing in the old country. So that's cool. Every time you, you make Italian eggs or a homemade pasta or a ragu or you know, some kind of a treat and you realize when you've been back and you've met with the family and see them doing the same thing, you're like, uh, just renews those connections over and over again. Absolutely. Well, thank you again and have a great day out there in Utah and we'll talk again soon. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Bob. Always, uh, always fun to talk about family history and, of course, things Italian. So take care. Arrivederci.